So my task uh, is to talk about economic and human development, a, f a view from the field. So I take tasks literally. Um, this is going to be a view of economic and human development from the fields of Dagumba farmers in northern Ghana. Um, I'm so grateful for having the chance to meet you and to talk with you uh, because I think progress towards understanding globalization and the developing world requires conversations between these great traditions, traditions of Catholic social thought, of economics, and for the next 20 minutes, uh, Dagumba moral economy. Um, like I think everybody in this room, I've lived a really privileged life. Um, one of the privileges of my life has been to have the experience of living and working in Ghana over a period of transformation of, 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 of this, the, the, the society and the economy really transforming itself. So I, I, I showed up as a school teacher right there. Um, and I, so I've been able to experience uh, a doubling of real per capita incomes in Ghana over the last 30 years. Um, so Bob Lucas yesterday talked about how the growth rate of Ghana over since independence has been approximately zero. That's because if you go back from 1980 to 1960, this line keeps going up. And so, so there was a long period of decline followed by a long period of expansion. And I've managed to be, I just caught the end of the decline. Um, so, so as economists, these numbers mean a little bit to us. Um, but there's the transformation that has happened in this country is visible. Um, if you go to the capital city in 1983, it was under military dictatorship. The capital was decrepit. The human and economic suffering was just manifest everywhere in the streets. Um, so this is, uh, this is a cherry-picked picture, but it, but it really describes the reality of life in, in, in Ghana, in the capital of Ghana in 1983. Um, this is another cherry-picked picture from this year. Um, not all of Accra looks like the fanciest hotel in the country. Um, <laughs> but it's not an exaggeration to say that there's a lot of a lot of Accra aspires to look like this, and there's a lot of stuff like this going on in the capital city. Um, there's still plenty of human suffering in the capital of Accra, but there's also these glimmers of, of, of success, of materialism, of people being well off um, that was almost entirely absent in 1983. Um, at the same time, well, I actually start, start with the blue graph. Um, the blue graphs of the national poverty rate. This is a, a Ghana poverty line. It's, it signifies real poverty. Uh, relative prices have changed. It's a little hard to translate into dollars, but say under $2 a day. Um, so it's really p being poor. And poverty in Ghana has had a substantial, sustained decline on a national basis. That's what those blue lines are. On the other hand, where I do most of my work in rural areas of northern Ghana, Poverty has remained stubbornly, um, annoyingly, um, distressingly high, and it's been stuck there for a long time. Now, as Joe Kaboski was talking about uh, yesterday, there's a lot of migration from these very poor areas of northern Ghana to other parts of Ghana, but there's also lots of natural population growth. And so, in fact, the number of people living in the rural areas of the north in Ghana is about the same. It hasn't gone down. And so there's a lot of people stuck in terrible poverty at the same time that the country as a whole is transforming itself. Um, so again, those were just numbers. You can see it as well. So here's a picture, uh, a fairly typical picture from 1981 of a, a typical community in, in rural northern Ghana in 1981. And a similar picture from one of the communities that my team and I work with right now in rural northern Ghana. I, uh, the bowls probably are not the actual same bowls, but the problem is life looks pretty much the same. Uh, there, there are changes. If you, if you look over in the corner, there's, there's a house that's got a metal sh roofing sheet uh, roof, and there's got, it's got better concrete walls. And so there, there is improvement. There's a lot of communities even in the rural north of Ghana that have electricity now that didn't used to, and that's transformative. But by and large, life looks sort of the same as it did in 1981. Why is that? The, the productive foundation of that rural poverty 
is low agrarian productivity in, in rural areas. It's the fact that farmers are not producing much stuff. So if you look across the world, growth rates and levels of agricultural productivity in Africa are systematically lower than they are in the rest of the world. And there's been more and more agricultural production uh, the populations are growing and people are eating and it's not all imported. A lot of, there's, a lot of, there's been an increase in the aggregate production of food in Africa, but almost all of that increase is driven by extensive, the extensive margin, people moving out to new, worse land. Very little of it is driven by increases in productivity per person. It's just a, a very poor agricultural system replicating itself spatially rather than transforming itself over time. In contrast, to what you see on the right-hand graph in Asia, where output per capita is going up rapidly in agriculture. Um, and so that contrast is our task. Our task, my task, um, and I think a fundamental task for economists is to understand why. Why is it that agricultural productivity is so low and so, low, so, so slowly growing in the poor areas of West Africa? Um, because that's the foundation of the rural suffering that we see in, throughout rural West Africa. So why is that? How to think about why? Well, to start, the economic environment confronting the poor in rural Africa is extraordinarily complex. The poor face constraints around them in all directions that are very tightly binding. And Decisions that you see the poor man, this I suspect is a general truth. I think that might be the first really general thing I've said about poverty around the world. But so the poor are faced with these constraints around them in all different directions. And a lot of things that when you first look at it are puzzling or seem short-sighted or, or, or irrational, in fact, have hidden explanations in the shape of those constraints that the poor face. This was the insight of the great Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago, T.W. Schultz, in his book, Transforming Traditional Agriculture. That look underneath, things that look foolish may not be. You may be foolish thinking that they are. Um, so I've, uh, here's a very, very, very simple example. This is my picture at the bottom of this page. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been walking with a companion through the streets of Tamale or somewhere in, in Ghana, and a truck looking exactly like that goes driving by, and my companion says, oh my god, these people don't know what they're doing, they're wasting their truck, they're, they're wrecking it. There's, why can't people be more like you Europeans, you know, treat their, 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 their capital goods properly? But in fact, this is precisely the efficient way of using a machine when the opportunity cost of capital is exceedingly high, like it is in rural northern Ghana. Um, the, the, the opportunity cost of capital is the interest rate, say. This guy surely is not going to have a truck for very many years. But f during the time when he's got his truck, he's earning a lot of income from that truck right now. And when you take the present discounted value of that flow of income, this is exactly the efficient way of using a machine when the opportunity cost of capital is high. So that was a very simple example of, the, of, of something that at, f at first glance and to many people seems puzzling, odd, short-sighted, foolish, in fact has a strong efficiency rationale underneath it. People are not wasting things when they're poor. They're thinking very carefully about their resources, their constraints, and, and their objectives. And that's a, this, is, this is one very simple example of that. Second, this complexity is very difficult to understand from above. It's not written down in laws. There's not a spreadsheet that has the various constraints that people are facing. It's informal. It's subtle. It has to do with human interrelations. It has to do with obligations to each other. It has to do with the way uh, local politics is organized. It's complicated. It's hidden. It's subtle. And it's malleable. So you can't expect magic bullets. Finding one constraint and relaxing it is a good thing, it's fine, but it's gonna reveal the other constraints that are hidden so far. This is the insight of the great political science scholar, Jim Scott, in his book, Seeing Like a State. Um, I love being able to pair Jim Scott, um, the postmodern political theorist, with T.W. Schultz, the Chicago <laughs> economist. But in fact, they're saying very much, what they're saying fits together very nicely. And I think that these two insights, when combined together, 
can reveal a lot about the choices and the policy options that are available to us for dealing with rural poverty in Africa. Now, what I want to do for the, the rest of my time is give you an example of that. I, I, I puzzled over what example to give. We could talk about property rights. We could talk about how households are organized, or how local political economies work. But I'll take something as simple as I can, and as visible as I can, and as much based on the view from the field as I can, which is, why don't, why don't these guys use fertilizer? Okay. If you look across the world, farmers in West Africa use inputs much less intensively than farmers anywhere else in the world. They use much less irrigation, they use much less fertilizer, they use much less improved seed. And the consequences of that are highly visible. Oh, sorry, I just forgot about this slide. I'm going to look at this now. I'm going I'm to try and understand that puzzle. Why are farmers using inputs so unintensively um, throughout West Africa? But I can't, uh, that's too big a question for me. Um, I, it's small by Bob Lucas standards, but it's still too big for me. Um, and so I'm going to do it, I'm, there's a little faint blue circle up on the top there. I'll talk about why the guys who are farming up in this area, uh, the Dagumba farmers in northern Ghana, why they're not using fertilizer, why they're not using seed improved seed. In that area of that, of that circle, the Ministry of Agriculture in Ghana has a recommended package of inputs. Um, oh, Cardinal Turkson, there's his hometown. <laughs> um, in that area, the Ministry of Agriculture has a recommended package of inputs that they think farmers should be using that would cost about $80 per acre. That's the package of seeds and fertilizer that they think farmers should be using. On average, farmers in this area use none. You know, the median farmer uses none. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture, on their plots using that recommended package, gets a yield of about one and a half tons of grain per acre. On average, a typical farmer in that circle is getting about 0.2 tons, about 200 kilograms, four bags of, of, of maize from an acre. And so the inputs are very light, the outputs are very, very low. Um, that's among the lowest yields in the world. Okay. And the consequences of those light inputs are, you can see them on people's farms. So guess who's farming the farm on the upper left? Okay, so that's a, that's a seed company using the recommended set of inputs um, in just down the road from these guys. This is actually a fine maize farm. This guy is, a, is is better than typical, this, this, this farm on the lower right. Um, that's, that's, that's what a, but that's what a standard farm would look like if you go to it. Um, what month are we in? It's May. Right now, actually. This is what a farm would look like. Okay. So why aren't these guys using inputs? Maybe they're not using inputs, just like my truck example, because it's a bad idea, because it's not profitable. But we've got experimental evidence from experimental farms that really makes it look like it's profitable to use more fertilizer and more improved seeds. Um, so just take a look at the, there's two groups of three graphs there. The, the one on the right is the extra profits you get on experimental plots from using this recommended package of inputs. That first one, on average, you'd make about $200 an acre in extra profits. And then there's some even better technology using organic manure rather than inorganic fertilizer that might increase profits by $300 per acre. Since a typical farmer's got three or four acres of land, we're talking $900, $1,000, $1,200 of extra income. That is real money um, to farmers in northern Ghana. So why not? Well, maybe they don't know. Maybe they just don't know about this technology. In fact, that's the starting point for a huge aid program that uh, the United States funded in northern Ghana, well, actually throughout Ghana. The Millennium Challenge Corporation is a bilateral aid agency of the U.S. government. It, it complements the U.S. Agency for International Development. They had a large aid program throughout Ghana. And um, they had an agriculture program that was part of their large aid program. So over five years, it was, it was more than $60 million. And the foundation of that aid program was to provide training to farmers in how to use modern inputs better and how to think more like businessmen. Okay. Which actually struck me as crazy because, I don't know, never mind. Um, 
Um, and on top of this training that they gave to 70,000 farmers, each of those 70,000 farmers also got a, what they called a starter pack, a, a, a package of inputs like seed and fertilizer that they could use on their farms worth about $200. Okay, so, so it was a big program. And then, so you know, that's one of the farmer groups they were working with, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. One of the great things about the Millennium Challenge Corporation is that they were very committed to finding out if what they did was effective. And so 70,000 farmers is a lot of farmers, but it's nowhere near all the farmers in Ghana. They couldn't reach most people. So since they couldn't reach most people, they randomly decided amongst groups who to reach and who not, since they couldn't reach everybody anyway. So you could compare the guys they reached with the guys they didn't attempt to reach and, and really see the impact of what they did. Obviously, they, I, I, this was a courageous thing for an aid organization to do. Most aid organizations will not do that because of a slide like this, which threatens you when you do something like that. The answer is we see just about nothing uh, for that $60 million. We see they, there were some small increases in input use. After all, they were given the fertilizer. They used some of it, and they used some of the seed, but they sold a bunch as well. Um, and so we see no change in yields, output, any measure of welfare we can look at. Essentially, we see no impact of this massive program. Oh, God, that's depressing. So what's going on? Why won't these guys use fertilizer? Why won't they use these improved seeds? Well, so that was, this, that was the question facing us. And so I and my colleagues went around. We, one of the great things about this job is I get to spend vacations going around and talking to farmers. And, and you can ask them, well, why don't you use fertilizer? Um, you guys can probably guess at least one of the answers. The first answer is, I'd love to use fertilizer. I just don't have any money. Okay, I just don't have any money. I, I just can't afford it. I don't have the money. The second answer is a little bit more surprising. The second answer that I get ubiquitously when I do these interviews with farmers is, I would love to use fertilizer, but what happens if it doesn't rain? Um, and then not only do I not get any output, but I've spent all this money on fertilizer and seeds and I'm financially ruined forever. And so we see two, there are a few other responses that come up from time to time, but these two responses are just dominate the conversations when we talk to farmers about why they're not doing this. Okay, fine, great, let's find out. So with some colleagues, we designed a, a randomized controlled trial, just like what the Millennium Challenge Corporation did, but um, we're not an aid agency, so it's easier for us to do this, um, where we decided to test those ideas. So to one group of farmers, we, you don't have money to buy fertilizer, we'll give you money. So we made grants to farmers, large cash grants, enough money, in fact, that they could afford to use the Ministry of Agriculture's recommended package on their entire land, everything they owned. So it was a big amount. God, that was a fun research project. My, going around giving people money, this is a really good thing to do. Um, um, my research assistants love that. Um, for another group of farmers to try to address this question of risk, we gave people grants and then later sold something called rainfall index insurance to them. I'll, I'll explain what that is in a minute. And then there's a third group of farmers that got both. Those guys are lucky. Um, and then a fourth group of farmers that are a, a control group that didn't have any intervention from us. Um, so what is this rainfall index insurance? Um, rainfall, so, so remember, when, when we talked to farmers about why they're not using fertilizer, they talked about risk. But they didn't just talk about risk in the abstract. They talked about a particular type of risk. They were worried about rain. Because in northern Ghana, nobody's got irrigation. They depend entirely on rainfall. And so farmers, if you t talk to farmers in northern Ghana, you end up talking about the weather a lot, okay? because it's salient. It's the risk that really matters. So we decided to develop a rainfall insurance system to give farmers payments if it didn't rain or if it rained too much. So in the United States, most farmers have crop insurance. That is, if they get a low yield, they get a payment from the insurance company. We decided not to do anything like that for a variety of reasons. Reason number one is if you give farmers insurance against a low yield, you have to measure their yield, which means you have to send somebody schlepping out to these tiny little farms, and the costs of doing that are extremely high 
compared to the value of the insurance. Second, let's go, this is economics, let's go back to incentives. If you give somebody insurance against yield, they don't have as strong an incentive to get a high yield because they'll get a payout if the yield is low. That's called, yeah, this value-free social science of economics calls that moral hazard. <laughs> okay. Uh, yet, yet again, we see this is not really very value-free. Um, um, similarly, whoops, similarly, um, the, the other thing that rainfall index insurance does is uh, if you insure people against low yields, and if, if, I've, if I've got lousy land, I'm more likely to buy the insurance um, because I know I'm going to get a low yield. That's called adverse selection. Again, not very value-free. So our insurance works like this. Um, we just tell a farmer, um, if, it, if there's a drought or there's a flood at a rainfall station that we designate in advance near your farm, we'll give you a payout. And so, and it, to be specific, uh, for our farmers um, who were farming these small farms, for every acre that they had farmed in the past, we promised them a payout of as, uh, as much as $100 per acre if there was a terrible drought or a terrible flood. Okay? And so that's the way it works. It's just, um, we give them a certificate. He's got his certificate. It's just a promise that if it doesn't rain, or if it rains too much at this rainfall station, we'll give you however much money corresponds to what's written on this insurance certificate. For this guy, you know, maybe $300 if there's a drought or a flood. Okay, so just to review, we had two different groups of farmers. One group of farmer, we came with a pile of cash and gave them a cash grant before farming began. The other group of farmers, like him, we gave them a piece of paper that said, if there's a drought or a flood, we'll give you a payout. Okay? So he got nothing but a piece of paper. Okay. Um, we did, in fact, make some payouts. So here's Hakim delivering money to a community that had a flood, obviously. Okay? And so, so the insurance did sometimes pay out. Okay. Hakim has insisted that this picture be in every presentation I give. <laughs> <laughs> on, this, on this research. Um, so here's the core results. So this is a little, um, to some of you, this is slightly a weird graph. Take a look at the line corresponding to 0.5. This is the median farmer, the typical farmer. And so the typical farmer in our sample spent, the blue line is the control group. They spent about $1,300 on their farm on inputs. Um, Inputs including labor and tractor hire, and if they used any fertilizer or improved seeds. So that's what they sent. Those guys we gave insurance certificates to, the median guy in that group spent about $1,900 on their farms. So we didn't give them anything except a promise that if there was a disaster, we'd pay them out, we'd, we'd give you a payout. We reduced the risk they faced, and they found the resources to increase their expenditures on their farm by 30, 40 percent, depending upon where in the distribution they were. So these farmers, when they told us they were worried about risk, they were really worried about risk. When we found a way to reduce their risk, they invested a lot more intensively on their farms. On the other hand, the guys we gave cash to when we didn't give them any insurance, nothing, just nothing is going on. They had better things to do with their cash than to spend it on this really risky um, farming enterprise. Okay. The guys who got both, they did fine as well. Okay. So what we found was a huge response of investment to our reduction of this most salient risk that these guys faced. And they responded in a highly sophisticated, thoughtful way to that promise of insurance. They adjusted the portfolio of investments that they made. I, I won't go into but the, the crops they grew and the types of investments they made. They altered their crop mix. And the demand for insurance, we sold insurance to them later on, once we found out that they really wanted it. Um, and, and we're working with the Ghana National Insurance Commission to develop a market for index insurance in Ghana. Um, the demand for insurance reveals that they're being very thoughtful about whether they should trust us and, um, and how much they know about our insurance. So you can see in patterns of demand 
emerging trust and lack of trust when we make payouts. You know, if Hakim came to your village, you've got now much more certainty that we will make the payouts that we promised. If Hakim didn't show up, well, you're not so sure anymore. So we see a lot of thought in the, in the processing of this new institution that we created in these villages. But I started off saying there's no magic bullets. Some good things happened. Hunger fell by a lot. Any of the groups, whether we gave them cash, whether we gave them this insurance or gave them both, hunger went down quite substantially. They found things to do. But agriculture, productivity, barely moved. It went up a bit, but not a lot. Not enough to make this really a profitable investment. Oh. Okay, so we've learned something. Risk really matters to these guys. We've learned some more. We've discovered a kind of institution that can help them deal with risk. We've again revealed that farmers are thoughtful and, and, and looking forward to what they can do with their resources. But we certainly haven't found a magic bullet to increasing agricultural productivity in northern Ghana. Follow-up conversations, just like the ones I showed you a picture of before, and some pilot studies that we've been doing ever since, suggest some of the other constraints that have come into play as we've relaxed this risk constraint. One of the constraints that comes into play is, in fact, technical knowledge. The Millennium Challenge Corporation wasn't out of whack. Okay? Um, they're using more inputs, using modern varieties, using lots of fertilizer, is putting them on a different part of the production space than these farmers are used to. There's a lot of things they have to learn. This guy's a really progressive farmer who has learned about pests and how to deal with seedlings. And, but most farmers haven't figured this out yet and, ha and haven't had the connection with extension agents to know to make tents over their seedlings. Um, so technical issues are one thing that has clearly emerged in the post-mortem of this research. Another is the timing of input availability. It's about to rain there. Those clouds are, are raining. You've got to have the fertilizer on your field in the right time when this is happening. And in fact, the marketing system in northern Ghana stinks. It's hard to make sure you're going to have these inputs when you've bought the seeds that respond very highly to these inputs. And if you don't put the inputs in, you're going to have a really disastrous yield. And so you've got to make sure that the bags of fertilizer are there at the right time. And a lot of people People got it too late. And then there's input quality. Um, most importantly, the agricultural research systems in West Africa are broken. They're a complete disaster. There's, in, in Southern um, Asia, in South Asia, the research systems pump out new varieties of seeds every year. There's this gradual improvement in the, in the biotechnology of the, of the seed system. In West Africa, nowhere in West Africa does that happen. The number of modern varieties is trivial, and they don't get new ones, and they don't even know what they are. The seed system, even when there is a modern variety, you can't be sure that what's being sold to you as a modern variety is a modern variety. Um, nor can you be sure that what's being sold to you as fertilizer is, in fact, fertilizer. Um, and so there's huge problems of input quality that haven't even begun to be addressed in northern Ghana. And so um, we're it's staying in the same area, working on all three of these dimensions to try to understand the extent to which, you know, we found that there's this insurance lever that will enable people to increase their investments. But now they're bouncing up against these other constraints. What happens if we relax some of these other constraints? So the basic process is very iterative. You know, I and my, my co-authors show up. We talk to people. We have focus groups. We have debates. Um, we show up with these results. We say, look, you, you particular, you farmer A, you used a lot more fertilizer. But you got nothing else out of it. Why not? Why didn't your output go up? And then we have a discussion about why she thinks her output didn't go up. And that leads to thinking about new theories about what are the binding constraints that farmers face. And then those new theories need to new quantification and empirical analysis and testing of those claims that emerge in the institutional conversations. And then we reject our theory, and then we start again. And so this iterative process, I think, can lead to small steps, no magic, whoa, no magic bullet. 
I swear there's no ma magic bullet, or at least I'd be, it'd be great if there was, but I'm, I don't know of anybody who's found it. But you can make little bits of progress as bit by bit we push the constraints that are holding the farmers, the poor, back as we learn about the constraints that are binding, as we iteratively reduce them. And hopefully, it feeds into policy like the, the agricultural insurance system that's now being set up in, in Ghana. Okay, so thank you very much.